I'm Dr Kelly Jowett. I'm an applied entomologist at Rothamsted Research and I work on carabid beetles. Now carabid beetles are of interest to farmers because they are major predators of all kinds of crop pests from slugs, snails, beetles, uh, weevils, all sorts. They're pretty much scavengers of the crop environment and they help to control a number of pests. A lot of people don't realise that they also eat weed seeds so they can eat up to 4,000 weed seeds per metre squared per day, which is taking a lot of that kind of weed seed bank out from your crop areas. So I've been working with farmers to try and understand the mechanisms with which they move into the field environment and provide those services where farmers really need them and when they need them. Oh, hello everyone. I'm Kelly Jowett. I'm from Rothamsted Research and I'm an applied entomologist. So um, I've been a postdoc for a year now and when I first met Neil I was actually still doing my PhD. Three years ago he invited me to talk to you all so I'm finally here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about my work around carabid beetles and I'll introduce why I'm doing that. So as I'm doing this maybe I can pass around my beetles so you can appreciate them close up. Why we're interested in carabid beetles is, although there's around 350 species in the UK, around 30 of them are very common in farmland. They occur in all kinds of habitats, but the ones we're interested in are particularly good predators, all sorts of crop pests. So there are some kind of specialist ones, but generally they're just the hyenas of the beetle world and they will just go around and, and munch on anything that's nutritious to them in the crop areas. So um, what a lot of people don't realise is that carabid beetles also eat weed seeds. Because if you th think about weed seeds, they're kind of like big packages of food for the plant to grow. So obviously they're tasty to the beetles as well. And some of them are quite specialist on that. And a nice figure I like to trot out is that carabid beetles can eat up to 4,000 weed seeds per metre squared in a day. So someone's actually multiplied that up and worked it out based on lab feeding experiments. But yeah, that's a lot when you're thinking of what they're taking away from potentially growing. So is there a size limit? Because they presumably don't eat a weed seed, but they could eat a black grass. They don't tend to eat black grass because it's not worth their effort in trying to get the mandibles around it because there's not much food in it for them. Unfortunately, everyone asks me that, but unfortunately no one's proven that they eat them. Maybe if they were hungry enough and there wasn't anything else around. But, so yeah. they could manage a, a fat cat? Yes, yes. Um, the particularly favourite of dandelions, dog violets. Um, what other ones are they? Um, Shepherd's Purse, they particularly like as well. But they must be tasty. So. so when we're thinking about trying to get them into farmland, we often think about feed, breed and shelter. So they have different needs based on the different life stages. But um, crucially, the larvae live in the soil areas in the crop. So, and they are more voracious than the adults. So, because they need the protein to grow, so they will eat more than the adults do at that growth stage. And they're living in the soil, so potentially controlling uh, more pests, such as cabbage stem flea beetle, where the eggs and the pupa would be in the soil. But not a lot of work's been done on that. So it is providing these kind of different habitats, because they will move into and out of habitats for hibernation and foraging. Um, Refuge from pesticides, obviously insecticides are going to hit them. They are said to be pretty robust to insecticides, particularly a spray, because it doesn't often reach the level where the carabids are. Um, but I will say all those studies that have done on this are kind of funded by the chemical companies, and they haven't really looked <laughs> at the sub-mortality effects, so effects on their ability to feed, which is what we want them to do, and their ability to breed. So... Yeah, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, so your advice would be to IPM generally, you know, kind of use less. But um, one thing that does hit them particularly hard is neonics because it's a systemic thing, so it does get to them. So. Um, 
And you'll see with the box that's coming around that there's a variety of sizes, shapes. Some, some carabids can fly, some carabids run along the floor, some of them are specialist on aphids. But also in with this kind of biodiversity aspect is that they all have different tolerances for environmental kind of uh, factors such as drought tolerance, heat tolerance, water stress. If you have a range of species you know, the weather's getting more and more unpredictable. In one given year, a, a particular species will dominate and take over the kind of primary <coughs> eating thing service. This year, I've had so many farmers trapping um, common heart shields, and I've never seen such a good year for heart shields. And it's just like, it is that thing of, in any given situation, one species will kind of take the bat on, as it were. So, so, so. that driven by the drought? Yes, I think it is just that the the drought has hit some species at key developmental stages. So carabids have two kinds of, there's two main types of carabids, ones that breed in the spring and ones that breed in the autumn. I think the ones that breed in the autumn, when they were larvae in the spring, they were kind of hit hard this year. So the um, heart shields actually breed in the spring and they probably got a head start this year. So I think that's what's behind it. So we have had a lot of research um, around carabid beetles so far. We still don't know quite some things, but we do know what we can do in farms in terms of agri-environment scheme measures. We are advised that tussocky grass margins are good for them because it provides an overwintering habitat. Hedgerows is a kind of permanent habitat in the farm landscape, so it's, it's important for them moving across the farm. And in terms of grazing, you want a tussocky sward that's creating microclimates for the carabids to kind of hide within. Um, at a farm scale, you're thinking about the way that carabids move in the landscape and being able to move field to field following where you need them to provide pest control services. So... Um, some of them will be flying, so they can fly over barriers, but um, the majority of really good predators are actually walking carabids. So we're thinking about the way that they actually view the landscape, like with that little slide about the kind of trichomes on the leaf. They, if you think of it at a beetle scale, barriers to those are much more kind of evident in the landscape. I, I'm coming to that. That's my very next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so the current thinking is that with more margins, we get this kind of uh, penetration to the field centre of that they will move around 50 metres a day. Um, and so you get this kind of what with what we are told is that there is a spillover effect from margins into the field and you don't get very high activity in the field centres. So. The, this is behind that kind of thinking of putting beetle banks in, wildflower strips, and then you kind of get them to more towards the centre. So my research is kind of, I've glossed some of these points. So which species are the most beneficial? Which ones do we want to encourage? Because they are variable. And about the larvae, not many people have looked at them because it's kind of difficult to catch them. Um, which of these measures are more effective for those species that we particularly want? And where do they need to be placed in the farm landscape in order to make them? I'm really in the way of you with the slides. Can um, So my first paper was taking a really big data set and looking at this kind of what is having an effect on carabid beetles. And I won't bore you with the statistics, but I actually found that there was big differences in what was affecting each species. So what a lot of carabid research has done in the past is look at carabids as a whole, just all carabids, what is happening to all carabids. Well, if you do that, you might be mistaken for thinking that all of the carabids really liked sugar beet and they were all in the crop centre. But in fact, when you see it from a species perspective, this is all based on this one um, rain beetle black clock species in the middle there, the uh, P. melanarius. So it's, the catch is overwhelmingly in this species, whereas some of them are particularly associated with margins at the edge of the field. So this is distance into the field. So some of them were actually at the edge, but that one particularly was in the centre, which biased the data set. And also, 
kind of went against what I just told you about the literature saying that um, beetles should be more at the edge of the crop and not in the centre, whereas all this data was coming from the centre of the field. But the data set I had was only 30 metres into the field, so I, I did want to look at that a bit better with a bit more kind of measurements. So my next piece of work is, so this is how we trap carabid beetles. Um, we have a, a kind of a pot just buried in the ground, beetle comes in, dies. <laughs> you have to kill them because they will eat each other. They, I told you they were hyenas of the uh, beetle world, well they, they will just eat anything. If they're in a cup with other ones and they're hungry, they'll just eat everyone else. So um, yeah, you do have to kill them with killing fluid. But to trap the larva, I came up with a novel method of putting this trap with wire mesh down under the soil surface so that they can come along through the soil down into the trap. Similar thing. And this kind of, this was my second piece of work. And we can see again that there's species differences in what their particular um, aspect was. This was based on a data set where I was sampling um, different rotation crops and um, with different effects of tillage. So each, each time I sampled a crop, it had um, tillage or zero till. And actually, I was expecting to see a higher kind of effect of tillage because I told you that the larvae breed in the soil. Well, I thought that in the kind of tillage treatments, there would be less adults as well as larvae. Uh, but the only thing that was really affected by tillage was these really big um, violet ground beetles. I think it's because they hunt in the surface chaff and they really like the, the uh, zero till for having that surface chaff to hunt in. And they also eat slugs. So it could be like the slug is in the surface chaff. You know, it's like hard to pick apart cause and effect with that. But So that was... Um, but the interesting thing for me here was that my subterranean traps revealed that um, if I just used pitfall traps, I wouldn't know that in the barley undersown with grass, um, there was actually much more carabid lava in that crop when it was undersown with grass. So you can see that green circle, if I just used pitfalls, which most people do, you would think that there was actually not many lava, but actually that was where there was most larva. And I think that's due to the below ground resources available to the larva in the different root structures and kind of that way that because they are predating underground. So um, that was quite interesting to me. So um, I really wanted to find out about that whole margin thing because if we're not seeing a spillover effect from margins into the field, from a kind of edge effect where abundances go down to the centre of the field, then is what we've been told about margins really correct? So I had these different experimental margins all across my farm site at Harpenden. So this is the Rothamsted Research Farm. And you can see where I've got all the margins. I also had um, subterranean traps. So each kind of, you can kind of see that these are different colours. So I had like wildflower, grass, and a control of um, no margin all across the farm. Um, and I trapped a, a lot of beetles. Um, so this was the kind of setup where I had actual traps in the margin, five meters in for that kind of spillover zone where we were told we would see the most activity, and then in the field centers. Was the first piece of trap in the margin? There was one trap in the margin, then five metres into the crop, then like crop centre to measure like what's actually, what beetles were in the margin. And then I could see what species were actually spilling over into that crop. So kind of relative measurement. Um, and quite um, predictably, the greatest position varies by crop, but the edge effects were the most significant. Um, so where it was next to an urban area, we saw less beetles in the crop right next to that, because they're not kind of migrating into the farm from, from those urban areas. So that it is having an effect in that there's less beetles right when you're right next to, like it was housing and roads. So is woodland better than grass? Or 
similar to the last slide. I, I didn't have enough repetitions to test woodland, but grassland certainly we saw a better kind of spillover from that. So, and the best one though was crop to crop. So because they're moving between the crops and the resources because they're hunting between those kind of areas. So, um, and I was really disappointed to see that wildflower margins were actually really poor. <laughs> I thought they would be good, particularly for the seed eaters. I'll, I'll go on to that. But um, the grass margin wasn't great. The, um, and in some instances, the wildflower margin was really um, reducing. So these, these blue stars here uh, are so showing that those are much lower than in the field measurements. So that was, I was really, you know, I was really rooting for the wildflower margins. So, uh, yeah, it may be that I had the wrong flower mix. It may be that they use them at different times of the year. So I, I did do a bit of extra work on that. It, it had been in place for two years and just moan. So... Yeah, we just kind of left them there to, so there was some, just once a year, I think. Yeah, there was someone else's margins that I kind of piggybacked on the back of there, so. Um, um, and this is by species, so yeah, it was, there was, there was actually one, one species that did actually like the grass margin. You can see that that square, they, they actually was a little bit more abundant in the grass margin, but they, they still didn't like the wildflower. And particularly the carabid larva were associated with them being no margin. So I'm, I'm assuming that's got to do with the properties of the soil um, and the way that beetles oviposit, so lay their eggs into the soil. Um, and the other thing about the distances was that this... This is a very complicated statistical model that even I don't really understand. Um, but when we look at the way that the different traps were associated with each other in space, accounting for all the other things that could account for that variation, when we take all of that away, we're left with a pure spatial relationship. And that spatial relationship for all the caravids altogether was around 50 meters, which accords to the literature. But this interesting thing is that when you look at it at a species level, these ones on this side are all running caravids, they can't fly. So they actually are moving around 100 meters. But because you include these ones that don't have a spatial relationship, these two species fly and obviously caravid larva will move at a smaller scale. Um, because you're having that kind of deadening effect on the variation um, that we're modeling, it kind of covers up that species spe specifics. So it kind of like levels out and, and makes it a bit noisy. So actually, carabid beetles can move up to 100 meters kind of between traps. So they, this actually means that in space, communities that are 100 meters apart are related to each other. So in your fields, it kind of means that they will move around 100 meters in a, in a kind of given time. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, so the main findings of that kind of work was the main influence is actually the in-field crop, what's actually in the field that's um, affecting the carabid beetles. The adjacent habitat can impact the in-field abundance, and field margins might actually impede the the movement of carabids between fields that are next to each other, particularly to those like running species. So they may kind of hit the margin and kind of bounce back off of it because to them it's, it's kind of um, a habitat that's maybe a bit less penetrable. Um, but field margins may be too small for them to perceive as habitat patches. Maybe they move in and out of them. And the wildflower mixes, as I said, may not have been the best ones to test. So it would be that I wanted to know about different wildflower margins and different kinds of things. So the message here is crop diversity would get a diversity of species and in-field measures may be more important. 
when we're thinking about where to put margins, maybe not put them in between fields so that the carabid can move round and round. Uh, maybe put them as a buffer and have larger margins at the edge. Because I'm not saying margins aren't important. They are. They're a good habitat and they are very useful for other species than carabid beetles, particularly flying species, lacewings, hoverflies, ladybirds, pollinators. You know, they are very important in the farm landscape. But looking at the farm as a landscape and where you put these measures to have the best effect is, is kind of crucial as well. Where does cover cropping or double not sure. I'd like to find out. So this is kind of behind the next kind of piece of work. So I found out these things, but I still need to know which species we really like and what measures are most effective because I've only got data that I've sampled myself. So what I've been doing is asking farmers to get me samples instead. So this year I've run the pilot of farmer self-monitoring for carabids. So actually getting people to go out in the field or getting the kids to go out in the field and catch carabids and tell me what they've caught. So this was just a pilot to see if the materials that I'd produced, and I brought a copy of my farmland carabid ID guide for all of you, hopefully I've got enough. Um, and if they could use that to identify the species, and if that information was useful to them. What I asked them to do was to do the same kind of thing as I'd done in my field experiment of having one measurement in the margin, one in the spillover zone, and then one as far to the centre as they could get, just to see the real field centre things. And the farmers were finding, just this autumn though, so I will say we may get a bit different message next year when we do more trapping in the spring and the summer, but we're still seeing that there's less carabids in the margins and more in the crop centre. And those are split by species. I've got the Latin names here because this was a quick put together of my actual current data from this year. But these are those predatory walking species here and they are in that blue line is the field centre. Interestingly, some of the smaller aphid predators actually were associated with the margins, so more data on that would be good. But I have yet to split this. What I want to do, I, I had some regenerative farmers, some of these was in uh, bird seed mixers, some of these was in cover crops, some of these was in undersown crops. Um, but I haven't got enough repetitions of that data to pull apart which kind of regenerative practices of in-field measures are the best for carabids and what species they affect most. So it will be that next year I'm asking farmers to do the self-monitoring as well. Um, I'm going to have a bigger rollout. We're hoping to support it with a phone app so that you can go out in the field and actually log it as a kind of data point and then I can map it directly and do a kind of landscape analysis as well as spatial analysis. And then hopefully you would have the kind of a little bit of the ID guide in the phone app and you could kind of look at them in the field. But I will say, um, I didn't ask farmers to always identify to species. I said, do your best, see if you can just, one, at, at the first level, just identify a carabid versus anything else. Two, um, kind of just identify what type of carabid it is. So a kind of a, um, to the black clock species or a seed eater or the kind of smallest carabids. And actually, many people who got involved with it this year could actually identify the species. It takes a bit of getting your eye into, but once you actually get looking at them, um, you can get used to the species you have on your farm. So, but some, some people had asked me and said that it might help next year to have um, ID workshops. So that will be something that I'm running at various parts of, across the UK, I'll be doing workshops with farmers to do carabid ID, if anyone was interested in that. So yeah, um, take the guide away. If you are interested in the scheme when we roll it out next year, please do get in touch. Um, any questions? Did, did, did the, um, the work, of the, your discovery of, of the more carabids in the middle field, as opposed to the, the margins, um, was that the same for all the farmers who are helping you? Do they, do, do they also... Not, not all of them, but when I put them all together, mm. that was certainly the case. There's no trend about what the 
crops were or whether I haven't got, yeah, or present or that's what I need more data for because the crops were so variable. I've only got like one measurement for, for certain crops and a couple for other crops. I'd really need at least 10 repetitions, 10 farms of one type of crop to pick apart if that's a real trend or not. And it may vary by if they've got um, just normal kind of winter wheat in it um, versus something with no till. You know, it may vary on the proportion of that kind of field centre versus field edge effect. So, so you could submit a photograph of where they've located the carabins so you can see you know, what the soil conditions are like or yeah. what, what the vegetation is. What, I was yeah. hoping that that could be integrated in the app so it would almost like guide you through and say, oh, what's your soil type? Um, what? And it would also be in with the mapping. If I had a specific location, I could look that up in our archives of the kind of soil maps from the UK, the habitat mapping from DEFRA Magic Map, you know. So it could almost be in my analysis that if I've got a point in time, I can do that. But also I'd ask farmers about the, the kind of things that are around them that only they would know. So. It could be. It could be that there's more mice in the um, in the field margins and they're actually eating the beetles before they even fall in the trap. So that would be something that I could account for. I actually thought of that, so <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, I'm, I've got a couple of um, cider orchards and they've gone into, more into a region and we are really suffering from voles. So it's amazing how you get rid of one problem and change over and then something else pops up. So. Oh, actually, though, thinking about that, if there were more beetles in the margin and they were being eaten, you would still see a spike in the spillover zone and then it would go down again, whereas we're not seeing that. Yeah, it is that kind of smooth kind of to the edge. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are actually, yeah, it's one of my pet peeves that they are only meant, they were, only mentioned in the agri-environment schemes as carabid beetles as being useful as um, food source for wild wildland birds, you know. So it's just like put these beetle banks in to feed the to, to feed the birds. Like no mention of them actually being useful for um, crop pest control. No, it's just like to feed the birds. There you go. Uh, I, th I think there's better guidance now. Only carabids that eat slugs. We seem to have a lot of rove beetles this year. Oh yeah, yeah. Rove beetles are the, the really big ones, the yeah. devil's coach horses, yeah. I think I think they tackle anything. They're pretty bolshy, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I think they eat slugs as well. They've certainly got the mandibles for it. <laughs> Is there any research being done in northern France in big steel scales and very different to our topography uh, on the carabids? Because they're doing a lot of research on all sorts of regenerative agriculture. I wonder if there's any comparisons <laughs> Yes, um, yeah, I know a few people at INRA who are doing some research into carabids. They're mainly focusing on weed predation at the moment, but yeah, I don't, I would have to ask them about the field edge, field centre thing. But I do know that someone who came to work with us at Rothamsted was working on agroforestry um, as a kind of, and looking at the carabid beetles with that. And he found that where you had an organic farm, um, the spillover from the edge to the centre was better because of the better soil conditions and the, the kind of surface kind of resources in those bits versus the um, tree strips. So the actual relatedness of the field to the, to the um, forest bits was closer than in the conventional. I hope I explained that right, yeah. Is there any point in counting beetles per metre squared or per hectare to give you an idea of where you should be aiming for? And have you done any work, say, for a no-till system, 12 million beetles a hectare is quite a good benchmark for? I would like to work towards doing that, but what we would have to do in order to work that out is have a better system of trapping or measuring them. Because the problem about pitfall traps is that it, it doesn't measure actual how many carabid beetles are there. 
it measures how many are running across the surface of the soil, which is a good kind of proxy for predation because if they're running across the surface of the soil, they're actively hunting. So that means that they're predating, but it's, um, they may be there, but they're not running around very much. Yeah, they're not going to get trapped very much. So, but if you have five traps in five square meters, does that? Yeah. Yeah, there there will be a way of measuring it accurately. No one's kind of figured it out yet. A way to get around this kind of pitfall trap problem. Um, there's been a lot of debate among entomologists in this, but it is the fact that we can't say that pitfall traps catch everything that's there. So it's really hard to put a figure around how many is a good number for a particular area. So yeah, it's awkward. <laughs> Is it near an exit They have a one year generational time and I, they are said this is in the literature that's funded by chemical companies though, they they are said to bounce back quite quickly from um, pesticides. So they, they can recover quickly. So yeah. Yeah, um, that was actually a trial. That data was from a trial on GM crops, but I I took the data just from because they compared GM crops and conventional crops. So I just took the data from the conventional crops. So I would expect that they didn't put any treatments on them, or they. Yeah, I don't know actually what treatments they would have put on, but I didn't read anywhere that there was neonics involved in the trial, so not sure. But that was a really nice data set for my first data set because it was over a number of years that they'd done this GM trial and all across the UK, so it was big repetitions, so that's quite a robust data set showing me that they are in the centre of fields and um, that it varies by species, so yeah. I don't use insecticides, and uh, so I've been trying to do everything I can to compare the beneficials. And on the back of the kind of work that we've been talking about from the assist project and the stock bridge technology project, I've put in lots of margins, and I've, I've actually started using uh, trying these in field margins. Um, what do you think I should do? <laughs> I know it's so hard, but I will say there are other species that benefit from the margins. Right. So they're not a bad thing. It's just that they may stop the movements of carabids between fields. But that may be compensated for, say, in rove beetles if they don't perceive them as such as a barrier. Right. You know, it's like there's this kind of effect of which, which species do you want for predation? But I would say my advice would be if you've got a field next to a field, maybe site the margins not like blocking them in. But yeah, I need to do more work in order to fully understand the mechanisms behind this because I don't want to tell people to take margins out. I think margins are great and they're great for a number of different reasons. Yeah, so it's, for, I would say for carabid beetles, it's based on how much you're doing, um, not with word in this really poorly. Um, so if you've got a bigger margin just on one side of your field, that would be perhaps better because they will move out from that quite a way. So it's thinking of it at a farm scale rather than having them all the way around the field, just have them at one edge of a field would be the same kind of thing for carabid beetles. And particularly where you've got that kind of urban area, use them as a buffer. But yeah, I, this is why I really need a lot more data from farmers, different types of margins, different situations, different landscape context to really understand what's driving that kind of the kind of dispersal that I'm seeing so that I can advise people properly because I really don't want to tell you to take them out because, well, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't expect to find this kind of stuff, but yeah, it is. 
So it may be that I get a different message when I get farmers to do trapping in the spring for me. It may be that I see some more in there, but I will keep everyone posted, I guess. But I think in the assist project, they had seen a good effect, a kind of spillover effect on predation. There was measuring predation in the field, wasn't they? So, yeah. Yeah, the ones that I had were three meter width. So um, it may be that bigger margins may be better and perceived as a habitat, but that would be something I would have to test as well. So, yeah, it's, it's the ideal environment for a habitat. Well, it depends on which species it is. That's the thing. So I'm thinking that the infield environment is better for the carabid species that we really want, those black clock species that are really predatory and are already in the field centres that you see, trying to encourage more of those in the field centre is doing things like reduced tillage, having um, <coughs> a habitat structure that's there all the time, so under sowing, so that there's that con continuation of resources over time, but also having a crop diversity in order that you get that kind of because it's, it's all very well saying for one species do this, but a range of species, like I said at the beginning, will mean that if you have a particularly bad year for one species, then, you know, another species will kind of take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems that way, particularly for breeding, because it's, it's encouraging those larvae, which is the next generation. And I will say that you get different sizes of um, carabids based on the larval conditions. So I've seen really tiny carabids this year, which has been so strange, but I'm um, basing that on um, the fact that the drought really affected the development of some of these beetles. So the adult beetles that are coming out are much smaller, because once they're adult, they don't grow anymore. But it, if the larvae are stunted, it produces smaller adults. So if you have good conditions for the larvae, you get bigger beetles that eat more, and it's all great. Zoom really, we're trying to build biodiversity around. So we don't want to have one species to do better than the rest. So yeah. So, so yeah. It's it's always about giving a range of resources, yeah. but how best to do that is always kind of open to debate, and it, we always need need to understand more. So yeah, it's a lifetime work to try and pick all of this apart. <laughs> Oh, so the, um, the weed seeds per meter squared. So it's 4,000 weed seeds per meter squared per day. That's up to 4,000. So someone actually got them in a lab experiment to eat weed seeds and then multiplied it up based on how many they found in a meter squared on a given day and kind of worked it out that way. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. That's really interesting. Thank you. Really good. Thank you very much. Oh.